Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Coordinas Deep Dive. And let's dive in. So let's take a look at um, the agenda. So um, basically, we want to get a taste of the plugin system, so what it is about, and the different types of plugins you can basically do. Um, then we want to have an advanced use case, and which is called a hidden primary. So we go into basically one of the use cases that you can use Cordian S for. And we have John jump into the code, and you can learn how to write your own plugin for your own specific use case. And then we have a small lookout uh, outlook, and then how you can contribute and actually make Cordian S better. So who who are we? Uh, I'm Michael. I'm uh, the maintainer, or one of the maintainers of Coordinas. I'm the founder of Oco Labs, which is an open source research lab, and also support companies on Google Cloud, Kubernetes, and around Coordinas via the company Record Solutions. And we have John Belamarek. He's a senior staff software engineer, and he's also a maintainer at Coordinas. So, plugins. So, Coordinas is based on a plug-in middleware system, so it's really a plug-and-play model type thing. So let's take a look at the different plugin types. So what you usually use by default are the core plugins, the ones that are actually in the Coordinas repository and that are maintained and controlled by the core team, basically. These include uh, the Prometheus logging uh, plugin, caching, the Kubernetes one, Basically, everything that is bundled by default. We have a few uh, other ones that are based, based in the core DNS as sub-projects. So they are still aligned with the overall project, but they are, might not be completely specific to your use case. And then we have the external plugins, which are completely maintained externally, but can be linked through coordinates.io. So if it's something that is relevant to your product or a really specific use case, you can still announce it, but it might not be bundled in by default. One of the um, plugins that's currently um, being proposed and will start as an external plugin is a Resolver plugin. So you can use it on your uh, home server or on your machine, and it will resolve DNS requests locally. So it will start uh, to basically mature as an external plugin and then probably move into the core DNS repository if it's good enough or stable enough to get bundled in by default. So let's look at one of the more advanced use cases. So what's a hidden primary? Basically, a hidden primary is a DNS setup where instead of pushing the configuration to, for example, Route 53 or your cloud DNS server, you basically have a hidden primary uh, control server which is the authoritative server um, from the behind the scenes, basically. So what happens in general? We have the user that is requesting a DNS record. That's usually going to a recursive one, which could be your ISP DNS server or <clears throat> your public DNS server that you use from Cloudflare, Google public DNS, or things like that. Uh, these are just recursives, so they don't have the authority to completely uh, solve the a DNS record, and it will then upstream if it doesn't know or doesn't have anything cached to the secondary uh, DNS server. So the internet basically, or every user knows about the secondary. So that's why it's a hidden primary setup. So no one basically knows that there's a server in the backend actually pushing the records. So how can that be used in a more interesting way? So Let's jump into it. So we can basically use a Git-based DNS. So especially for open source projects or bigger companies that need uh, an audit log on their, uh, or their DNS zones or on their records, they can use Git for that. So either you, some companies use like a small library that will consume the Git-based zones and then push that to their cloud provider, which then serves the zones. That's nice and possible, but with the hidden uh, server or the hidden primary use case, we can actually manage a lot more. So we basically get the data from the Git repository. 
In our case, we use Git Sync, which is a small sidecar in, uh, in Kubernetes, which will pull in the Git repository, which is basically just bind formatted zone files. And this will uh, locate the data in the sidecar next to Core DNS. Core DNS has a few plugins, one being a file uh, plugin and one being an out, outer plugin. It basically can read in uh, zones from the file system and then serves them authoritatively and also adds a, can, add a, sorry, can add a few more features. For example, rewrite, so you can rewrite any queries you want to have specifically handled. So this server, Core DNS basically, as the hidden primary, will then just use um, notifies to notify the secondary DNS, uh, DNS server to publicly or pull the latest updates. So sometimes these notifies get lost on the internet or some authentication might not happen or something like that. So that's where we jump into the server record. So it's the, basically the primary, the start of authority um, record. It's the one that describes or that's the one that's the most minimal record that's needed in each zone. So just to get into it, um, I know probably most of you already know that, but just to get the construct right. So example.com would be the zone. Um, then we have the TTL of that specific record. Um, and then basically the record type being ZOA. The ns.example.com would be the actual, the actual um, uh, name server that is publicly requested for all the requests on the, uh, on the internet for your specific domain. And then we have a weird one. So domains.example.com, it looks like a subdomain, but it's actually an email address. The problem with emails, the at is a special character which can't be used in any zone files, so that's why the first dot will be translated to the at. But more interestingly, so we have the serial, which is probably self-explanatory, but more interestingly, we have the different TTLs. Usually they are, without, uh, they are added without the comments, so you basically see uh, four numbers, no one usually knows what they are, but to get into what they can be used for and why they are important for our hidden primary. So the refresh rate is basically how often the secondary tries to pull data uh, from the primary. The second one, the retry entry, is how often it, is, it retries uh, to check if anything changed. So it basically just pulls the header and then checks the serial if it's updated or not and then uses the refresh rate to refresh the record. Then we have the expire. So in our case, we use a hidden primary in production. It's running in one of our local Kubernetes clusters, but it's a replica and sometimes it goes down. But the wonderful thing about this setup is as long as the expire is longer than our downtime and we don't do any changes, no one notices. So the expiry basically tells the secondary how long he can answer authoritatively on your domain or on your zone without checking in with the master. After the time basically is expired and the master isn't reachable, it will drop all requests and basically fail in next domain. And the other one is minimum negative caching, which is really helpful if you change domains and want to black hole a domain or zone. So if you had an old subdomain which is not really used and you don't have negative caching on, you might run into a huge bill on your DNS provider uh, because it keeps on keeps on spinning and doesn't cache on the ISP level, it doesn't cache on the resolver level, and we ran into that once, switching a customer, and it wasn't a huge bill, but it, we still uh, got probably 50, 000, uh, 50 million uh, DNS uh, queries more than we actually wanted to. So let's jump into the code. All right. Uh, my mic. Okay. There we go. All right. Um, well, so as Michael mentioned, uh, Core DNS is a plugin-based system. What that means is um, that a request, a DNS request that comes in, is is passed through a number of handlers and you can insert handlers in that chain uh, of your own. Um, 
few things to note about that. While it is a plugin-based system, it's, it's written in Go, uh, and it's not using the Go um, dynamic loading plugin facilities. So it's actually, the plugins are all compiled in. That means that if you do want to create your own plugin, you're going to build the whole executable, not just your plugin. Um, but nonetheless, it's pretty easy to do. And um, you can, you can uh, accomplish a lot of interesting use cases this way. Um, the plugin we're going to show here as a demo is really a stupid plugin. Um, it's always going to return, no matter what you ask for, uh, one of two different IP addresses. Uh, one dot one dot one dot one one dot one oh, quad one or quad eight, and uh, and but it's going to look at your client source IP and it's going to decide how to do it based upon that. Um, the code for this is on that GitHub. It's super simple though. Uh, we're just going to go through the code and I'll explain the different pieces you need in order to create a plugin. So. Essentially, for a simple plugin like this, it's two files. Uh, you could put them all in one, but it's two files. It's a setup.go, which contains um, an init function. That function is, uh, performs the one-time initializations, including registering this, the setup function with caddy. And the, so QWERTYNS uses, there's a, there's a web server, a Golang web server called caddy that's been around for a while. It's got a plugin architecture, and it's got a, um, uh, it's a sort of server infrastructure. So it, that's what we've actually pulled in and built our server around. So it handles things like um, restarting the server uh, in a safe way by starting up a new one and destroying an old one and handing off the, the, uh, the sockets. It, it handles the parsing of the configuration file for us. Um, essentially, a lot of those infrastructure facilities for building a server are all taken care of for us and letting us focus on just the, the DNS pieces. Um, so in order to, um, to build your plugin, you're going to integrate with the, that set of libraries. Um, and the, the init process, this registration process, is essentially just telling Caddy, hey, when you read this configuration file, you're going to get this directive, a string demo in this case. And uh, when you get that, I want you to call my uh, function over here, the setup function, and pass to it the, uh, a handle to that configuration file, basically sitting there right at that, at that directive, so I can just consume the things that are relevant to, to my plugin. Um, that's what the setup does. It, it parses that. It adds the handler. I guess if you, if you weren't at one of the earlier accordionist ones, um, you may not have seen the explanation of of a core file, but essentially in a, in a core file, in our configuration file, there's, there's multiple stanzas, and each of those stanzas can have a different uh, set of plugins associated with it in and, and a different zone. So you could say uh, example.com goes through this set of plugins, and um, foo.example.com goes through this different set of plugins with different TTLs, different cache, everything. Um, so those stanzas are, uh, you get this setup call once for each of those stanzas in which your plugin uh, directive exists. Um, and it's the responsibility of that setup call to, uh, to, to create a configuration, um, essentially to, to parse its configuration, create an object, and then associate a handler uh, for that, for that, uh, with that stanza internally. Finally, there's the serve DNS function, which performs the actual request processing. So uh, to look at the actual code, you see it's just a handful of, uh, handful of lines of code here. The init does the registration with the, the, the keyword demo. Um, server types DNS, uh, Caddy supports two server types, HTTP and DNS, and only because we added DNS. Um, but the, the actions, the setup, as I said, that gets called. Uh, the, when you get this handler for this caddy configuration file, this con caddy controller, you, it's sitting basically right at the token that, that, uh, that was passed into register. So you can, can consume that one, and then you can just start to, to consume the different pieces. In our case, there are no parameters, so we don't really do anything with it. 
what we do is add this handler. So it's the handler is done as a um, you're basically there's a, an interface you have to implement that has serve DNS in it and name, and those are the only two functions, um, and you pass that in. Here we're instantiating the demo object. If if we had parameters for this that for the configuration, we would we would fill that in there. Uh, finally, the serve DNS, which doesn't look the same on the screen now than it did before, so um, seem to have lost the spacing. But uh, in this case, super simple. You get you get three parameters. You get a, a Go context, which we can use for all sorts of tricks and games later if we wanted to. You get uh, a response writer, which is essentially just uh, a, a class or a, an interface you can call in order to write the actual response back to the client, although we have some um, implementations of that that will essentially capture it and let, let you manipulate other plugins data. And, um, and finally, you get the DNS message, which is the actual request. And uh, in our case, like I said, it's a super simple, stupid plugin, and it just has one if statement and changes the reply uh, based upon that. And the next, there's a little, uh, this is the continuation of that function. It basically creates a, um, a resource record for the reply, a DNS message, and sends back success. So uh, we can try it. This is what the core file would look like for um, for this particular case, we just have the one one plugin activated. Um, this is a Docker command you can use to build it, so you don't have to get your whole Go environment set up if you really want to. And uh, so we can look at what that looks like. So I've already done this. I've already did the build, so I won't run that again. But uh, we can run the actual core DNS. We can see. Uh, what these, the, the one thing I didn't mention that you have to do if you're going to do this is you have to add this to the plugin CFG, which is essentially just our, uh, our way of doing the, the plugins uh, at build time and sort of pulling them individually. Um, this facility makes it really easy to build versions of core DNS that are scoped to a particular purpose. So, for example, there's a node local DNS project that uh, just came through Kubernetes uh, in 1.13 in alpha, and that's done by actually stripping out all of these uh, plug-in CFG entries except for the very few that you need, and that way we got the executable down to pretty much as small as we could get um, as far as a memory consumption, and because uh, it's going you know on, on every single node, so it's uh, it's a nice way to tune things and keep your resource utilization low. In any case, um, you insert this in the plugin CFG, and one very important thing that's kind of, I think something we're gonna need to fix eventually, is that this also dictates the order in which the plugins are past the request. So your stanza that defines what plugins are activated for that for a particular zone, it, it uh, you can't change the order. The order that you put them in that stanza doesn't actually matter. What matters is, is whether they're there or not. If they're there, they get added to the, to the chain of uh, plugin, plugins, but they're always added in the same order, which is the order of this plugin CFG. That can limit you in a number of ways. Um, we haven't figured out a good way for, from a configuration point of view that, that's not too painful. To, to reorder them, because there's some of them do need to, to appear in a certain order uh, to work. But um, in any case, if you're building your own plugin, you're building your own version of Core DNS, be sure you put your plugin in the proper place in the chain um, so things can, can handle it properly. All right. Um, so we have it running over here. And oops, very exciting. We will. Um, And it doesn't work. I hope that's because I made a typo. Uh, there we go. We get 1.1.1.1. No matter what we pass over here, we, we, we see the log. So not very exciting as far as a, or, or useful as far as a plugin, but uh, gives you the basic structure of what you would need to do if you want to create your own. 
All right. So the last thing we wanted to cover was the outlook. And then uh, we wanted to leave a lot of time for questions. Um, and if, oh, that's fine. So a few things we're looking at going in the future. Um, the, we, we've recently added something we call the metadata plugin. And what that does is it allows the passing of information from one plugin to the next. So where this is used today is in things like the log plugin. So you could publish to this to the, to the Go context, this metadata, um, and then the log can put that in your log. So if you had something um, special, you didn't want to print like error log messages, but you had some status or something you wanted to come out of your plugin, you could push it into this metadata, and then anybody who's using the log plugin could configure it to actually put that in the logs if they wanted to. Um, there are a few other really interesting use cases I think we'll be able to, to do once we have this fully plumbed through everything. One is that uh, we have another plugin coming soon called Firewall. This is a very simple sort of allow deny for requests. So you could do that based on client, client IP, record type, whatever it is in the request. But if we allow, say, the Kubernetes uh, plugin to publish metadata about the request, so, the, so it could publish, for instance, the namespace of the source pod, uh, the, the pod corresponding to the, to the client IP, then you could actually use that Kubernetes metadata within the firewall plugin to build all kinds of policies about how you're allowed to, uh, to, to resolve requests. So those are some of the things we're looking at um, in the near future. Um, anything else you wanted to discuss? Yeah, so one interesting um, use case for the firewall plugin, for example, is um, this called, or you can route traffic through DNS text records. And for example, if you allow at an airport uh, DNS, you might be able to tunnel traffic through. So one idea is to basically disallow text records uh, in airports or something like that. So that would be a use case for the firewall plugin, which is really tangible. And the other one that is basically coming or that we're looking into is a writable direct API. For currently, um, like how it's done with Kubernetes, you would write something into Kubernetes or etcd, CD, and we can basically serve it from CoreDNS. But we might look into the option to directly write something into CoreDNS, which is then served. And the general, we are looking into performance optimizations, especially around gRPC, where we want to have the opportunity to go DNS over gRPC, so we can also do watch-based DNS. So instead of having a lot of idle traffic, refetching records, it might just be able to hold the cache as long as possible until the record changes, and the change isn't a pull-based one, but a push-based one, which is coming from the central instance or the Kubernetes master. And if you have any other ideas for plugins, <laughs> especially pl uh, external plugins for now, uh, give us yeah, come over and or do a pull request or issue, and we're happy to receive um, any contributions. So we're uh, on GitHub, on Slack, and if you're used in uh, if you're using CoreDNS in production, we would love to hear about it. So please open a pull request and open uh, and add yourself to the adopters file so we can see who's using what, how, and how we might improve as a community and in general. Also. Code, contributions, and as I said, plugins, always welcome. So, any questions? And uh, before, you, before you start, we do have, uh, we have 10 t-shirts here. So, uh, I don't know what sizes. You'll just have to get lucky with the sizes. But, uh, but every good question, not bad questions, good questions. So, ones we can answer, maybe, or maybe ones we can't answer would be better questions. <laughs> um, you'll get a t-shirt. So, who's first? All right, right here. I have to turn this off. We also have stickers for the bad questions, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Uh, th thank you for the talk. Uh, so the web server component seems to be a very critical piece of uh, the entire project. Uh, do you guys, uh, I mean, that's Matthew Holt's Caddy project, right? So. Do you have a separate fork wherein you can just put in whatever? I mean, if there's a fix, do you do you do you contribute upstream to Caddy and then 
pull that KDE specific version into Code ENS, or do you have a separate fork and just maintain yours? And because that will have more flexibility into whatever changes you want to push, you can just push it and make a new release for Code ENS and just push that. So. Uh, no, we don't have a separate fork. We use the upstream um, caddy, and we haven't had any real issues. We work pretty well with with Matt, and um, you know, so the the times we've had, we, we found bugs. We've we you know, in say the we saw we found some in the restart process. So there's certain events that go out and were causing issues during restart under certain conditions. So we were able to upstream any fixes like that. So we haven't had an issue with that. It also depends on the use cases. So if you use something within Caddy that might be a bit more unexposed and he's changing something internally or the Caddy project is, um, you run into that issue more often. Um, but then it's basically, it's a build time error. So um, you could do that by actually uh, building a specific version. Um, but we try to run as close as possible uh, because it's still, most of the code base is the same. So we want to have the same bugs and therefore fix it upstream faster. Any other question? Ah, lots of people want shirts. All right. No. Uh, all right, right here. Actually, it's a rather quick question. You told that there is no right API currently in code NS. I have a zone file and add the record to it. How do I make a server to understand the file is just in something like RNDC in bind? So the, the file, I believe the file plugin, but definitely the auto plugin will monitor the file automatically. So as soon as you change the file, at, well, after a little while, it's, it's actually pulled periodically. It'll, it'll look at it, and it'll see that it's changed, the serial number's changed. Don't forget to change the serial number. And then it'll, it'll reload it. So no support for DNA, D, DDNS. What we're looking at, so, so the idea behind the writable API is that we, we have all these different backends, right? We're not, we don't just have one. We have many different ones. And so we don't want to come up with one storage and, you know, keep the things and, and all of that on our own, we'd rather have that be a function of the plugin. So right now we have, a, a, a like I said, two, two functions you have to implement for a plugin, name and serve DNS. Well, we would add another interface for a writable plugin that allows you to store a record. And then the, the plugins that have that capability, like so let's say the etcd plugin, would, would implement that interface. And then on top of that, we build other plugins that can do the the external APIs for those. So you can do it through our gRPC interface, or we can implement a plugin that does um, it through DNS, with the DDNS, or we can implement a plugin that has a RESTful API. So the idea is to still keep those, um, the, the writing and storing function separate from the, uh, how you tell core DNS about the record. Okay. Uh, so, so on the on the file based one, so we did use um, notifications on the file system. So uh, the the second you basically change the file on the system, we would reload it. Uh, but we ran into some race conditions and issues with generally how FS Notify works. So there were so many bugs that were just annoying, and reading files most likely isn't that problematic, depending on the size of your zones. So it, it now defaults to, I think, 30-second um, pulls, and you can do go down to like a second. It usually shouldn't be any issue. Norris? Hey, so um, right now, uh, CordiNS doesn't have a native recursive resolver. We have to compile from source. Is that always going to be the case, or is that is there a plan to merge that in? All right, that's a really good question. You definitely get a shirt. So, um, the, so Michael mentioned this early in the talk. So we do have a, a plugin, external plugin that compiles in Unbound, and that will allow you to to do recursion. But we recently had a, a contributor who wrote, uh, I think he calls it SDNS. It's a Golang recursive DNS um, server that he's already written. He just uh, stripped out a bunch of stuff and made it into a plugin. So it's brand new. It'll start as an external plugin that's not necessarily built in by default. Uh, and then you know, as we see it mature and we're sure that it's solid, we'll, we'll pull it into the, into the core. So that, we're very much looking forward to that. Uh, all right. 
Get one more back here, then I'll go back up front. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering what's the if, if there is guidelines and gochas um, around uh, moving from kubeDNS Cube uh, as default to CardDNS when you're running running it into production and you're rolling just your 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 deployment. So we did. Uh, there, there were a few talks about uh, specifically that um, that topic. So basically, the move from kubeDNS to CardDNS is a performance one and a reliability one. So a change, for example, that is really important is that uh, we didn't do negative caching with kubeDNS, but we will do with CardDNS. The other thing is it's easier to maintain because kubeDNS was a bundle of DNS mask, uh, which is single-threaded, and SkyDNS, which is sort of partly maintained. And now we move to the only single one, uh, which is much more extensible. And the the uh, cluster plugin uh, or add-on we um, or John briefly mentioned called Node Local, uh, which is available as alpha in uh, 1.13, uh, which adds a daemon set of a minimalistic core DNS instance, and it also spreads around all the different uh, external requests. So internally, um, as we said in the core file, you can set depending on your your path or your zone, uh, it will answer differently. So all the internals will still go to the central CardDNS instance, but everything external will go right upstream, so you completely move around any issues and any bottlenecks inside the, uh, the central one. So for the migration, um, so the, the, what I would do is I would create a deployment with CardDNS that's got the same labels as the, the kubeDNS instances and, it, and get it in the mix and make sure everything's working well for you and you're watching the metrics and then you can you can transition it. So it keeps the, if, you were, if you're running kubeadmin, it will, uh, I don't think it upgrades you by default, but if you specify to upgrade you, it will switch it over. Um, but it keeps the same service name because service name and cluster IP are immutable. So the, yeah, I would use both in parallel until you're comfortable and then you can, can finish switching over. So I guess we had two more here before. So anecdotally on the, you can look for the next question. Um, so Minikube, for example, had the problem that they wanted to switch and accidentally it deployed both and then noticed that uh, because it's still using kubeDNS as the uh, cluster service, uh, basically both responded and there was like a weird issue where they're like, oh yeah, our DNS fails, but only like half the time. So um, they fixed that, but it happens, so you can actually use that as a deployment mechanism. Huh? Yeah. I was wondering about the process and timeline for new plugins going through, you know, external to subproject to core, and as a aside, uh, what plugins are compiled with the official um, core DNS uh, image? Very good questions. Um, so the, uh, the process is pretty informal. So if it's a big, complex plugin like this rec uh, recursive DNS plugin, there we're going to take more time. We're going we're gonna to see that. If it's something really small and simple, we may just pull it, in, pull it in immediately. We try and keep things compiled into the basic default image very um, general purpose, useful to most people. So if it's a really narrow use case, then it won't, won't make it in there. And I need another shirt to get you your question. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, so um, n yes and no, I guess, is the best answer. Um, we don't support views in the sense of bind right now. Um, we do have, um, there's some external plugins that could help you. Do we have a, uh, there's a, an external policy plugin that you can use an external policy engine to do all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, but we are looking at, I know Francois over there, he's somewhere over there, he's got a, um, some plans to build a plugin that would allow you to do something very similar to views. At least the basic functionality of views. Does it support DNSSEC? Yes, it does support DNSSEC. It's not um, it's it's not full support of everything. I, I, um, Cricket Lou was here earlier doing some of the talks, and he would be able to. He's more learns a lot more about DNSSEC than me. But he said something like, 
you have to use the same key. You can't do split keys. It's, it only supports one of the algorithms. So there's some limitations, but it does support it, yeah. So I just wanted to ask if, if there's any any plan to to support you know the, the same features that Route 53 has you know in terms of you know splitting uh, the requests by by weight or failing over to to different services. Um, not specifically, but you know those are the sort of things that can be added as plugins if people come to the uh, com community and they're really interested in it, and especially if they're willing to contribute. Um, I do know there's some. Um, uh, I lost the thought, but there, there, there has been discussion of, of some of these things, and there is a, there are some plugins I know for, that Infoblox did that do uh, alternate or fallback type of things. If you get a, a if you get a, uh, a failure from the upstream, like a, a serve fail, we'll go talk to a different upstream or do different things. I mean, we we already do that in a way, but it's a slightly different semantic. Yeah, you can also like there's a plugin called Fall Through. Uh, so as long as the other plugins in the chain support it, um, if it doesn't have an answer, it will just fall back to the next plugin in line. So you could say, um, if it's in the zone files that are local, for example, uh, then it will serve it. If not, I will fall through to the internal DNS server. If that's not, you can fall through and do something like that. And you could add uh, one specific, like, um, reading zone files from your own API implementation or something, and then if it doesn't uh, fall through, and then fall through to the central core DNS in Kubernetes, for example. There was a question back here somewhere. I think that saved you a trip. Um, now with, uh, I've been trying to write a plugin for a while. Um, are there some common pitfalls you've seen people running into through this process? I don't think you get a shirt for that question. Um, <laughs> no, I, 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 <laughs> I, I don't, um, I can't think of any offhand. I mean, you know, it, well, I go, okay, some would be if, if you, you have to be careful about how the reload semantics work. So sometimes people, or even us in a lot of our earlier plugins, had um, like a package specific, a package global variable, and then when reload happens, they don't play well together and, and, and you get problems. So you, so that's one, I think, area to be, to be careful about. Another one would be probably um, the order in which you add it into the uh, plugin uh, CFG. Um, because it might be that you rely on something in, as a general um, serving plugin or something. And if you put your plugin before that, it might break all of the other plugins. Because there is some implicit ordering for some plugins. So if you interrupt them, you might break the build type thing. Like, not the build, but uh, at the runtime. I still have two shirts. No? All right. Thank you. We'll, we'll be up here if anybody has anything to ask. Thank you.